Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. With all the testimony that I've heard this day, I don't see how any person of conscience, character, and civility could not understand that the facts have been given and now all we need to do is just tell me what are we going to do about it what kind of campaign are we going to wage collect Vice Chair Brown, I can. Uh, you went out on on my end. I can't hear you. I think I think Senator Bradford has his hand up. Okay, uh, Senator Bradford, you are recognized, and we can go back to Vice Chair Brown in the event that he wanted to continue. Go ahead, Member Bradford. Thank you. I just want to thank all the presenters that just presented, but especially uh, Dr. Shirley Weber, uh, my former colleague, and uh, Mr. Jones, sorry, your former colleague in the legislature, and my former college professor. The question that has been asked of us most, Dr. Weber, I guess this morning is, what do we, or of some of the presenters, what do we ask them, their feelings on what reparations looks like? As the author of this bill, can we hear from you? What, how would you surmise what reparations should look like uh, here in this, um, in California? If that's an appropriate yes, question. You know. Thanks for that question. You know, I remember once when someone asked Thurgood Marshall, we were in a meeting together, uh, what did freedom look like? And he said basically that when the poorest and the least um, resourced person of African descent has the same chance and opportunity as the one with the most, then we will have achieved a sense of freedom and equity in this country. And uh, and, and so, you know, when I think about reparations, uh, clearly I, I think of the, the, the sister's family who's lost so much as so many of us have, the opportunities that can't be quantified, you know, that you can't, you can't quantify uh, my father's lack of education and the negative experience that he had and just trying to survive for himself and his family. You can't quantify that, you know, you, 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 you have to begin to say, okay, um, where do we, what do we do in terms of opening up this particular society in a, in a way that really makes an effort to, to create the opportunities for those who are here, but also for the next generation to come, that it should not be something that can, you can't buy it with $20,000 that somebody asked me about once before. Uh, you can't, you can't, because that in itself is, is not even, you can't even, you, as you begin that, analyze how much it would cost, it, it becomes those things. So we have to look at every institution that we've had, whether it's home ownership and, and finances, and begin to ask when will, we, when will we reach equity and parity and how do we accelerate that experience for so many? And some are looking at that. And, and one of the things I'm pleased is that some of the nonprofit groups, one here in San Diego, one of the foundations is, is actually creating an opportunity and they've raised, I don't know how much money to really start talking about Giving, helping black people buy houses in San Diego to motivate them to do that. That becomes important because we know that that is the wealth of most of our families, that most of our families have any resources at all because they bought a house and were able to keep that house. And now we're in a position where, you know, where most folks can't afford it. And so we're, we're limiting the ability of wealth that's there. Um, education should be available to every African-American, regardless of, of, of uh, their background in terms of the resources they have. University of California should be free to every black person in California, period. Uh, you know, we can talk about all the other things that happen and other people might say, what about us? Well, I understand that and we can talk about that too. But we should make it available to every one of our kids who wants to go to college and who can qualify and most of them can because we know that the qualifications at the University of California have changed so dramatically 
Uh, when others don't meet those qualifications, we now don't require the SAT. We don't require this. We don't require all those things that we thought was the holy grail that we would never give up. We've given up all of that stuff and still have, and we have not lost the quality nor the expertise nor the statue of the University of California. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, we create these things uh, without, and then soon as the circumstances change, we give them up, we drop them and run on to something else. So, I, you know, I think, I think you have to do those kinds of things that are bold. Every black child in California sh is, that's born should basically be going to preschool because they have to catch up for themselves and their mother who didn't go, period. You know, they've got to be a dip. My, you know, I had to be a different generation than my father. Father went to the as far as the fifth grade. We could not say, surely, therefore, if you get to the seventh, that's a good thing. No, I had to catch up with the white folks that he was competing with, that he knew he had to live with. And so I had to do more than that. And, and I think that's what we have to we have to be unapologetic about it. At least I am that we have uh, generations and generations of folks who have sacrificed who've given so much. And we need to look at every indicator that we think is important in this country. So that when it gets to a point, where, as I used to tell folks in, in schools when we were talking about education and surely when will we get, when will we reach it? I said, when I can look at a school and see the test scores and not know who's in the classroom and who's at that school, then I know we okay. Because as long as I can look at the schools in LA and say, okay, this is black and brown, black and brown, black and brown, black and brown, I have a problem. Okay, I have a problem without even looking at the addresses. Because that says to me that we have a system that is institutionally denying people an opportunity and is structured that way to do that. So when we get to the point where we don't know who lives in the neighborhood because all those wonderful houses and places are there, when we look at these companies that are being developed and we see the wealth that's there and we don't know whether this millionaire or this billionaire is black or white or whatever, we will then have arrived. Then we can begin to start talking about how we have been fair and honest with those and giving them a platform for development and growth. So it's comprehensive and it's not something that will happen in one year. I'm, I'm hopeful that this commission will, will decide that there needs to be a statewide ongoing presence about reparations and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, and legislation that goes in and assessment and evaluation to get us to a place where we need to be because it will not be this 400 year uh, challenge is not going to be solved in 400 days. Uh, you know, it's going to take much more than that and a commitment from the state of California the fifth largest economy in the world to make it happen. I think it plays into the nexus of uh, also uh, ethnic studies, which you two authored that bill, because we heard a lot of folks this morning and yesterday say, oh, I didn't know the history because it hasn't been taught. So I want to thank you for ethnic studies as well. Ethnic studies is critical. The brother who talked about the jury selection, most of you, my colleagues here, well, with, with us at AB 3030, 3070 last year that dealt with the issue of, uh, of dealing with the, um, the, uh, the removal of people off the jury peremptory challenges. We did that. That was a hard fought battle. And the good thing is we had some Supreme Court justices fighting with us, but we had a significant battle in the Senate to try to deny us the uh, opportunity to get rid of these peremptory challenges and to make those challenges have to have some substance to it. Uh, people are still trying to, there's a, there was a bill this year, once again, to, to, to invalidate that bill at AB 3070. Fortunately, my colleagues in the Senate killed it before it got any breath at all. So, I mean, these are battles that we fight in the legislature on behalf of us. And, uh, and I'm hoping that the public pays attention because once we obtain something, rest assured, they're coming back to get it. They're coming back to get it, and it's just a matter of time if we're not paying attention. Thank you. Member Joan Sawyer, you're recognized. Member Joan Sawyer, you are recognized. Let me get off of mute. Uh, good. It's good to see Secretary Weber here. And, and I just want to take this opportunity. I don't know how many times. Uh, we'll be able to get the three of us together, especially when it comes to public safety. Uh, you have the chairs of Senate Public Safety here and the chair of Assembly. You do have two African-American men that are in charge of public safety. As Dr. Weber mentioned earlier, um, some bills got stopped, and it stopped because people that look like us are there in positions to ensure that our people don't get per further harmed. But Dr. Weber, it, it, we, we need to look at probably the, the last, one of the last remaining plantations on this planet, which is our <laughs> correctional system and our prison system. And the prison plantation system is still harming 
thousands and thousands of, of, of our people. Uh, and so um, as we move forward, and I know you, you still have some car, some scars on your back from getting the police use of force bill through. Uh, we all, and Steve's laughing too, we all got, with SB2 and decertification, we all got scars on our back from um, doing what we needed to do um, to ensure that um, these laws that were put in place, and plus those, those, those things are in the fine print, because if we have read the fine print that freed us, that said that if they jail us, they can then imprison us as slaves again, we probably would have not had that in there. And so we're working real hard to reverse that uh, after a hundred years. And so uh, from your perspective, I, we're gonna have a discussion about this um, further down the line, but how do you, how do you feel we can incorporate some of this in here? Because there, as you said, they're coming after us. Last year, the, the law enforcement spent $2 million to make sure I wasn't on this Zoom call right now. So uh, it, it, it is important there that we, we reform the criminal justice system. Well, welcome to the Million Dollar Club. They've done the same to all of us, but let me just <laughs> say that um, it, it is no question that um, the, the penal system itself and, and how it has operated in this country um, is, is really an embarrassment to this nation. It should be. Uh, no one has as large a, a, a prison population as California had. We had 180,000 people in prison when I became a member of the assembly. We're down to the 90s, right? 90,000. We've cut it about in half. And people are upset about that. So therefore, you're going to see more and more efforts to legislate or to create uh, more crimes and more felonies than you have before to, to basically incarcerate more individuals. Um, we have to begin to make sure that uh, that there is rehabilitation in our in our penal system. And I've had people in the system tell me that they're not going to do re rehabilitation despite the fact that we've changed their name to rehabilitation. Uh, there's no effort to try to, uh, to the folks to go in, into prisons to come out better than they went in uh, to deal with it. We also have to deal with our, our K-12 system. You know, that is the pipeline to prison. You know, the fact that we are struggling so hard to get our kids an education, to teach them to, to have the kind of necessary skills to, to basically create an environment for themselves. I mean, that in itself, and then you, you know, it feeds right into our prison population. We reduced our juvenile population immensely. Uh, we have to continue this police reform and, and keep in mind that those who are opposed to it are going to use every fear tactic in the world. And despite the fact that we have reduced our population in half, we have not seen an increase in crime. Uh, you know, those are the things that people talk about as if we're going to do, we're just seeing all kinds of things occurring and the data doesn't bear that out. And so I'm hoping that those who are, who are, um, who are fighting this battle know that there will be numerous strategies used in order to keep you from understanding just how insidious this penal system really is, how many of our folks that it takes from us, uh, how it keeps people in prison for long periods of time, uh, and, uh, and, and then how we've discovered also that it's so corrupt that oftentimes the people who are in it uh, didn't commit the crime. Uh, we have created some legislation that, that says that now finally gives people who have been discovered that they didn't commit a crime. One gentleman was in pri prison for 17 or 30 years. I can't remember which one. It was two of them. One was 17, one was 30. And when they let you out because they discovered you didn't commit the crime, they don't give you anything. They don't even give you bus fare. You yeah, don't have a place to law. stay. And so we now have the new a new law that uh, that I did that basically gives them makes them have to give them a place to stay and those kinds of things because they assume that they will sue. And if, even if they sue, it takes years and years and years to basically get the resources. But there's no apology. And the general attitude is, well, they may not have done that crime, but we know they did something. I mean, that's the attitude after they have kept you in prison for 20 years of your life all of your career, all of your economic producing life, and you don't even leave with, leave with a place to stay, money to buy groceries. Oftentimes they have to stay with their attorneys that got them out. And so we are, you know, I've worked with them in terms of legislation to make sure that they have free access to college, that they basically got health care. They didn't want to give them health care uh, and that they had an opportunity to have a place to stay. I mean, those kinds of things are fundamental if you're letting them out. But you would think that there would be some mercy or some uh, apology from uh, folks who've incarcerated you unjustly 
for, for 10, 20, 30 years, and there really is not. It's amazing what people say, well, I know they didn't commit that crime now, but I know they did something. So they want to create justice even in the unjust situation that the folks are in. So we have to begin to struggle with that because that is a major issue that's affecting our community, even as we struggle to get people out who've been uh, through DNA tests and so forth and so on, uh, that the system still believes that they're, that they're guilty of something, and sometimes we'll make it that possible by the denial of opportunities, denial of resources for them to live appropriately, and then to pick them up anytime they feel they can. Thank you. If there are any other task force members who would like to pose a question or comment, please do so now by speaking up or using the, the backstage chat feature. Got a question for you. Sorry, who 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 was speaking? I, I just said Dr. Groves, we can't hear you. I think she's speaking. Oh, yeah, okay. Member Groves, Member Groves, you are recognized. What's going on? Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for Ms. Bassiano. Um, it, your testimony um, really tore at my heart, uh, and I, you know, as a psychologist, um, it you know it really piqued my thoughts around this particular question, which is, if reparations included something to promote healing from the pain that you and other families like yours has had to endure, what strategies or resources do you think would be considered helpful and would resonate with you, your family, or families like yours? Um. I think there definitely needs to be conversations. We need to have an environment where folks can talk um, and understand, you know, the trauma that's that they feel. Um, I don't want to equate it to PTSD, but I've heard that. I don't know if that's applicable. <laughs> but there are, you know, resources out there for individuals that have, I guess, a, a clearly diagnose um, mental health issue. And I think that some of the things that we deal with and that trauma that's continued generation after generation falls somewhat into those same categories. And I think resources should be made available. You know, we talk about also um, reparations. It needs to include health care as well. And that health care, if mental um, health services are required or needed, they should be available. And it should be something that's easily accessible and removing that stigma that's attached to it. Because I think people may not understand that, yeah, there is pain that's associated with this, knowing mm -hmm. what happened to you, to our families. Um, and it's crazy because, again, I didn't realize how much it affected me until preparing for my testimony. And, you know, I, I really was not going to do this because I just – it was the weirdest thing, just reliving it, thinking about it, knowing the pain that my great grandmother went through. It's hard, and so definitely there should be something available to families who are still experiencing that trauma. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. I have a question. This is Lisa Holder. I have a question for Dr. Weber. Um, thank you so much uh, to all the all the experts and witnesses who spoke today. Very, very insightful and moving commentary. Dr. Weber, I wanted to specifically ask you your thoughts on the notion of intent versus impact and outcomes. You know, for so long, we have tied racism and discrimination to this idea that the perpetrator has to overtly intend to do harm, right? And that's very, very difficult to prove in any setting, especially in the courtroom, because someone has to use the N-word, or so you need a smoking gun to be able to get into the mind of the perpetrator and show intent, you know? And so, for as, as a litigator, I try to shift the focus on impact. What has been the impact on the victim? What is the outcome? 
And I think as a, as in, in a much more sort of macro level, reparations does that, right? And honestly, I followed your work for so long. I think, a lo I think that's the through line in so much of your legislation, moving away from intent toward outcomes and impact. Um, and, you know, and the work that we do at EJS as well is very much a, a around dismantling intent, focusing on outcomes and, and, and outcomes and impact. So my question for you is around this notion of reparations as really shifting the focus to the outcomes, right? Like the massive wealth gap. gap. We don't really care what the banks intended, you know, when they, when they wouldn't give black people loans, they created this wealth gap. We care about the outcomes. We care about the fact that it's $1 to $10 between black wealth and white wealth, right? And so how do we really keep, I think reparations is one important framework to push back on intent and put the focus on impact. How do we keep pushing back and institutionalizing this framework? Well, I think you, you, you do that by constantly, as you point out, looking at the outcomes. You know, um, because you can you could frustrate yourself trying to find intent. Every now and then there is some document that says we, we're going to hold them back and we're not going to give them an opportunity. But then that turns out to be limited to the person who did it 50, 60 years ago and, even, and, and not necessarily the person who, who is sitting at the bank right now. But the outcome is uh, of the, the actual impact is very clear, whether you know why you're doing it or not. And, and the consequences of your, on, on a person's life is the same. Whether they intended to do this or not, it is being done. And the impact is still leaving you without the resources you need to grow and develop. And it still feeds an institution that continues to do that. So I've never tried to deal with intent because that gets too much into people's mindset, their heart, their this, their that, stuff I can't really be even begin to deal with. Because we hear that often, that, well, my grandparent didn't do that, or my grandparent did it, but not me, blah, 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 blah. Yet you're still riding in the car that your grandmother gave you. You're still able to purchase land from, from resources that somebody gave you years ago. You're still benefiting from the homestead acts that brought in uh, hundreds and hundreds of foreigners to take free land in this country. I mean, you're still, you're still riding on it. You're still living off of it. And so it, it becomes, it, it, to me, it's irrelevant at, at some point. We need to look at the intent to make sure that there was, that the institution did what it did on a consistent basis. The laws it created, the rules and regulations that it imposed and all those kinds of things. But in the end, we need to look at the outcome. We need to look at the impact that it had and how do we change that so that it can continue to have that impact in the future. I mean, I think that is critical uh, much more than anything, because even if we're able to address the initial impact, if we don't change the institutions that produce those kinds of results, we know we will continue to see that. And uh, and we will continue to see it in our communities and our lives. So uh, I've never tried to deal too much with um, with the intent because that gets into people's minds. Did they really intend that or did they not? Or maybe it was someone else that influenced them to be that way. Who knows what the end result is that it is still having an impact. And basically, when we look at things that that exist in in society and other areas, we are we sometimes look at intent, but we more importantly look at impact. If some company is cheating a whole bunch of people, it is impact. And, and maybe you weren't there when they did the first thing with Johnson & Johnson and the powder for women. But in the end, we look at the impact that it has had on, on ovarian cancer and women across this, this nation. So we do look at impact when it's to our advantage. We have a tendency to want to hide behind intent when we think it is far removed from us. Thank you for that. I have a, a, a quick question for Professor Powell. Well, it's a two-part question, actually. So the first part of my question, um, you, you hinted on it in your opening remarks, um, but I'm curious to hear from your perspective if you could expand on the connections or the intersections between the war on drugs, uh, mass incarceration, and, and voting rights and voter disenfranchisement, um, particularly um, on the federal level, but also um, on the state level. And then also, I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, badges and incidents, right? Um, as, a, as a lawyer, as someone who enjoyed uh, learning about constitutional law in law school, a lot of the times, you know, we know section one of the 13th Amendment, but we 
often uh, ignore Section 2, which authorizes Congress to eradicate all badges and incidents of slavery. And so another part of my question to you is, you know, what symbolism is present today that you think um, are, st are vestiges of slavery or uh, badges and incidents of slavery that could still have a, a psychological effect for Black Americans living today? Um, and if you have any solutions related to the eradication of these badges and incidents. Thank you. Paul, you are on mute. And your your video. Yeah. Are you speaking, Mr. Powell? I can see his frame. I, I he's not present. Yeah, I think he stepped away. Well, at least my questions are on record. And um, he can get back to to me on to us on those questions. Um, do any other task force members have any uh, a last question or so for Ms. Bassiano or Secretary Weber? Uh, Chair Moore, I have a quick question. Um, yes, for, your thank you. Um, just first, I want to say thank you uh, to Ms. Bassiano to Mr. Powell. Uh, and to our Secretary of State, Shirley Weber, for um, the telling your personal stories, but also the expert um, testimony. This question is for um, Dr. Weber, and it just, it, it, it keeps coming up a bit in our conversations. And I'm asking you because of your advocacy around uh, Prop 16, which was somewhat with regard to timing, kind of simultaneous with AB 3121, um, we are discussing uh, parameters of Prop 209, while not wanting to be confined by those parameters, are still, you know, we'll, we'll still have to deal with that um, as we put forward a proposal. So just based on some of the, the results of Prop 16 and some of the attitudes around, um, you know, the, the, the proposition, um, what, do you have any advice moving forward as we do our community outreach about how to uh, approach those issues? Well, you know, one of the things, and thank you very much, Monica, and thank you for being on the commission. Um, one of the things that uh, that you should be aware of as a commission, and I'm, and I'm sure you are because all of you are very experienced and have been around the block more than once, is that as soon as you begin to talk about redistribution of resources to the extent that someone doesn't get the cookie that they got last time, you're going to get resistance. And I think you know that. Uh, you know, the, the talk about equal opportunity and equity, the talk about opportunities uh, at, at the University of California and how to how to direct uh, how to correct that. You know, uh, you're going to have folks saying straight up, uh, I don't want to give up my seat to anybody else. OK. And so uh, and even if you said, well, OK, we're going to double the number of seats in the University of California, then somebody's going to say, well, I have some extra kids I want to get in, too. I mean, the, re the resistance is going to be there. And so I think it will be important for you. And I'm hoping, as I, I, as I told folks in, in the initial phase of this, that these hearings are made public, that there are public discussions, that people can see, uh, hopefully, um, the damage that was done by specific laws and regulations that they can relate to. Uh, I was on a reparations call with a young woman who was talking about how her family got into the Homestead Act and uh, and they were recruited when they were Russians in the 1800s and brought in at the time when they were supposed to be given reparations to black people, they didn't. And they were brought in and given all acres of land somewhere in, in the middle Calif in the middle US. And the only thing they had to do was keep that land for five years, build something on it, whether it was put a plant or put a shack or whatever it was. And then the land was deeded to them. They were given citizenship to be brought in. These are white uh, uh, folks from Russia because they want to increase the white population. And they were given free land. She said, and my family did absolutely nothing to earn it. She said, so when people talk about, uh, you know, black people didn't work hard enough, people didn't try hard enough, and these opportunities were there. She was emphasizing, I'm a living example that my folks didn't work at all for it. 
She said, and that land has been either kept in the family. People have uh, have basically uh, expanded it, uh, used it against the collateral, uh, this, that, or the other. She said, uh, one uncle bought land downtown as a result of the land, and they still have this land and the resources in their family. And that resources have fueled her graduate. She's a lawyer. Her graduation and all of her cousins and what have you to be able to have a base upon which they could go to school. So I think it is important when you begin to um, uh, go out there with what you, you you're going to do. Uh, you need to help people understand that this is not a, a freebie. This is not a giveaway to a group of people who didn't deserve anything. And that's and when she she did her presentation. And this is a white woman who decided she needed to do something to make people understand that this was not just, uh, you know, that, that there's, there, there's a challenge that's there and that, and that those of folks like her actually benefited from the racism of this country and the policies that were developed that gave them free land. She said, and I listen to people talk about how black people didn't work hard enough. She said, and my people didn't work at all for it. All they had to do was do something small uh, for five years. And at the end of five years, they not only got had gotten their citizenship when they brought them in, they brought them in, gave them citizenship, gave them land, told them they had five years to do something with the land. And at the end of five years, the land was deeded to them, period. One of the Homestead Acts, deeded to them. And then they could do whatever they want with that land. And her family had done, she had a list of all the different things they had done with this land as a result of the United States recruiting them from Russia to come over here and pay their way over for them to come and to be homesteaders. So there's a lot of effort that, you know, we need to make sure people understand how this country was developed because we have a tendency to think it was some bootstrap concept. All these people working very hard, uh, you know, sacrificing, doing this, doing that. And they just roll right in, put fences around some land and claimed it and had five years to, to do something with it, whatever it was, or even if it's just put a fence around it and they owned it. And, uh, and as a result, that fueled their economic development in their families. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think it, it's important. You're going to run into that immediately. That's what we ran into. We had a lot of folks talking about affirmative action, a lot of folks talking about equity. But in the end, if, if that meant my little Johnny didn't get that University of California seat, even though you have four generations of University of California in your family and can afford to go anywhere you want to go, they were not willing to share that seat with anybody at all. And so, therefore, they gave us Prop 17. <laughs> well, Matt, Madam Chair. Um, John Powell is back, Vice Chair Brown, and yeah. I wanted to. Yeah, hi, John Powell. Yes, uh, you're asking a question about the 13th Amendment and the Section 2 of the 13th Amendment. Yes. So, yes, so I, mm -hmm. go, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I just would, wanted to summarize if you didn't hear, but if you're okay, then you can go, proceed. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you summarize? Because I, had, I'm, I switched to my phone. Yes. So uh, really quickly, it was a two part question. I wanted to hear you expand upon the intersections or connections between uh, uh, voter disenfranchisement and the war on drugs and mass incarceration in California. We can stick to California. And then also, I said I was really uh, I, I love that you brought up uh, the badges and incidents right in Section two of the 13th Amendment, because oftentimes and we've seen this through Abu DuVernay's documentary 13th. So we focus on section one a lot, which is the involuntary servitude exception, but we don't always focus on section two, which authorizes Congress to eradicate all badges and incidents of, of slavery. And so I'm curious, you know, you've lectured at law schools all across the country, even my alma mater, Columbia Law School. So I just wanted to hear your expertise around how if, is Congress underutilizing that power? So the, the short answer is yes, but I'll come back to that in terms of uh, uh, the war on drugs and mass incarceration. Uh, a good friend of mine, Michelle Alexander, uh, wrote a book called The New Jim Crow, which I would strongly recommend. And one of the things she documents in there is that uh, at the end of the Civil War, a number of the states start passing a plethora of laws directed at blacks uh, to actually get through that exception in the 13th Amendment, that exception being that you can, you can enslave people if they first duly um, uh, tried and committed for a crime. So uh, the war on drugs was a deliberate effort, and, and it's not even subtle. Uh, someone talked about the jure and de facto. I think uh, Secretary uh, talked about that. Um, the government made it clear they wanted the war on drugs to actually attack blacks and, and they call it hippies. Uh, 
and so the war on, you know, uh, whatever it, it took. I was talking to uh, my partner recently about the difference between crack and cocaine. So a lot of the, of the effort was a deliberate trying to actually create laws as a way of controlling not crime, but controlling blacks. The war on drugs was really a war on blacks, and I've written an article about that, which I'd be happy to share with you. Uh, on the second question, on uh, the enabling clause of the 13th Amendment, and most people don't realize this, that most provisions of the Constitution do not have enabling clauses. That is, it, the clause is there. It doesn't say that Congress or anyone has any right to enforce it. That's the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment all have enabling clauses. They all say that Congress, not the court, not the president. Congress should have the power to enforce these laws. Um, and again, I think Congress under, under, underutilized that enabling power. So, for mm -hmm. example, when Congress made a finding that racism still exists and therefore we need to, to, uh, um, uh, to continue the Voting Rights Act, and then the courts come back and say, well, we made a finding that racism doesn't exist, the court doesn't have that power. The Constitution gave Congress the power to make that determination, which is unusual, not the court. And I just taught this yesterday at, at, at University of California, Berkeley. I said, really, we should have had a constitutional crisis because c the courts were overstepping their bounds. This was the Congress is to be the fact finder as to whether or not there is racism in America, not the courts on this issue. The last thing I'll say is that Congress could do a lot in terms of reparations. Congress could do a lot in terms of affirmative action because the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment was designed to affect you know, free, uh, the enslaved blacks. It's, it's race-specific, especially the 13th Amendment, uh, but Congress has never pushed it as hard as they could. So you're exactly right. We haven't paid attention to the enabling clauses of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Thank you so much, Professor Powell. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have run over time for our, 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 our witness panel four. I would like to thank uh, Professor Powell, Secretary Weber, Chair. and Ms. Bassiano. Madam Chair. Uh, yes, I'm, Vice Chair. I'm coming for the Secretary of State. Yes, you're recognized. Madam Secretary. Madam Secretary. Yes. Thank you so much for your excellent leadership and for your pioneering spirit on this measure. I want to say we've had an excellent expose on those past egregious sins. But we have some right now sins against black folks. These are the, in the area of housing. These developments in these inner city communities that were developed 50 plus years ago by black churches have become gentrified. And this is one thing that has contributed to breaking up of the black watering holes and historic communities. I give you a concrete example. El Bethel Baptist Church, two blocks from my church, built 355 units. And that was supposed to have been a means of giving blacks who were underserved the opportunity to gain housing, seniors. Presently, those 355 units, only 45 black folks live there. 45. Now, I am not in any way xenophobic or nationalistic, not in my bones. But what has been happening, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and local housing departments, have not been fair in making sure that this lottery system does not break a fair opportunity for black people. 
to stay in the communities where they were. That is an, a form of that same denial, oppression, and destruction of the black community. So we need to we need to do something statewide. I know we got 209 and all that stuff, but in this reparation effort, we need to say they need to repair this breach, this injustice. There ought to be fair opportunities for black people to still have their ethnic enclaves the same as other communities do. But there's been a scheme and a system to destroy that. And we've lost a sense of quality community because of that one area as regards housing. Same thing obtains for Martin Luther King, Marcus Garvey, named for two iconic black leaders. But right now, 70% of the residents are people from other communities. Not knocking them, but if they tell us to go over to people, places like Pittsburgh, move out. We ought to say to them, some of you all need to move out too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown, mm -hmm. for that statement. So again, I would like to thank um, our expert witnesses and those who have um, given personal testimony today, namely uh, Professor Blackman, uh, Professor Lynn Hudson, uh, Isabel Wickerson, Professor Parman, uh, Ms. Bertha Gorman, um, and also Secretary Weber, Professor Powell, um, and Ms. Don Bassiano. Uh, thank you very much. Now we have to move to our next agenda item, which is agenda item 18, adoption of findings. Um, and so for the interest of time, I'm asking the, t I'm asking the um, DOJ to um, put on the screen the findings but I'll also just read them so that we can facilitate um, this part of the agenda a bit uh, more uh, quicker. Uh, so basically, just as an overview for the task force members and members of the public um, about the particular item, um, we are, oh, excuse me. So um, I just wanted to remind members of the task force that the draft findings were included among our meeting materials. And also, I would like to remind the task force members that pursuant to the process that we adopted in the July meeting, these findings as adopted today will, will be circulated to the task force so that members may draft potential conclusions based on these findings. Those conclusions will be com compiled by staff and circulated to the task force as a whole in preparation for the next meeting. So in order to facilitate this more quickly, um, I'm going to um, uh, uh, proceed by topic area. So there's findings by topic area. Um, and again, I'll read them, um, but for the benefit of the public and, and the benefit of task force members, I am uh, kindly asking for the DOJ to put these findings onto the screen. Thank you very, very much for doing so. So. Now we will get to um, the first uh, findings by by topic. OK, and then we'll have a discussion about the findings um, by topic, and then I will entertain a motion uh, by topic related to those findings. Are there any questions uh, or clarifying questions that I can um, address uh, before we, we dive right in? Okay, hearing no questions, we'll dive right in and we'll no, start I, with- I, I actually have a quick question, um, just in terms of procedure. This is, this is a, a list of, I think, 20, 24 findings. I don't know whether people had an opportunity to go through them, but I was wondering just to expedite the process, whether um, people could, if there, if there are items that they, um, you know, have some sort of comment on or objection to whether they could just state those in, instead of reading through every item. That makes sense. So, 
So, yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and in the interest of time, I think that that makes um, the most sense. So, um, you know, does any task force members have a comment, critique um, as to any of the uh, 24 findings? Okay, at this time, I would, I would like to entertain any task force member who would like to entertain a motion uh, related to this agenda item. A motion could look like adopting all these findings in full, hearing no objections, or in part, it's just a recommendation or a suggestion. I have a procedural question, Madam Chair. Yes, Member Gross, you are recognized. Um, so, for example, um, on page 109, um, findings topic racial terror, um, uh, the KKK is um, noted along with lynchings and a few other things. But um, we we can revisit these in the in light of subsequent testimony that is yet to happen. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Because there's some more things that could go under that section, but we've yet to hear testimony in certain categories that would further inform that. Similarly, under the category of California um, and um, um, disenfranchisement. So if we have an opportunity later to amend these, um, I just wanted to make sure procedurally that, that I was understanding that correctly. Yes, that's my understanding as well, that we can amend these. And then also, uh, uh, again, we, we're also going to draft conclusions based on these findings. And so, like through our drafts of those conclusions, we can make notes um, as well, based on what we heard today. That's, that's another thing that I wanted to bring out there. Right, because also one other example is under re-enslavement, there were actually policies that re-enslaved black children. It was the precursor mm -hmm. to our welfare system, and we are still dealing with the consequences of that. So, yeah, so there's much more testimony, I think, that we need to hear to fully flesh some of these categories out. Yeah, and to be honest, you know, we, we didn't necessarily receive these until this past week, so honestly, it does take... Uh, it's going to need to take more attention. Madam Chair. And Terry Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, it, there's one recommendation that I could make is that you adopt these as preliminary findings of fact that will allow you to come back at a later time and amend them with additional findings. Thank you uh, very much for that suggestion, uh, Parliamentarian Johnson. So again, at this time, um, would any task force member like to entertain a motion related to this agenda item at this time? I would like to, this is uh, Member Grills, I would like to entertain a motion to uh, accept these as preliminary findings of fact, subject to change or uh, subject to amendment with additional information in future hearings. Thank you, Member Grills. It has been moved by Member Grills to adopt uh, these draft findings as preliminary findings of fact, uh, uh, with the notion that we will be able to amend these findings um, in the event that additional information um, is gathered. Um, is there a second on the motion? I second the motion, Madam Chair. It has been moved and seconded that we adopt these findings as preliminary findings with the ability to amend the findings as appropriate. Oh, is there any discussion on this matter? Hearing no discussion, I would like to cue Parliamentary Johnson, who is in queue, uh, Ms. Belton, who will take a roll call vote on this motion. 
Madam Chair, would you like to restate the, the motion that they will be voting on? Yes, Parliamentarian Johnson, the motion will be that we will adopt these tasks, these draft findings as preliminary findings with the ability to amend the findings as more information is gathered. Thank you. Um, Attorney Belton, would you please call the roll for the vote? Thank you, Chair Moore and Parliamentarian Johnson. We will go in order and I ask the task force members to indicate their vote. Chair Moore, your vote, please. Aye. Aye. Chair Moore aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Yes. Yes. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes yes. Senator Stephen Bradford? Aye. Aye. Senator Stephen Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills? Aye. Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Lisa Holder. Aye. Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer? Aye. Aye. Assemblymember Reginald Jones Sawyer votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki. Don Tamaki votes aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Stepp. Aye. Aye. Councilmember Monica Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Madam Chair, on the motion, there are nine members present in voting and nine aye votes, zero nay votes, and zero abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Belton. There are nine aye votes and zero nay votes. The ayes have it and the motion carries. So we will adopt these draft findings as preliminary findings with the ability to amend the findings as we as we collect more information. So now it's 355 and we'll return to um, what was order. on our yes. Point of order, Madam Chair, we have to go back to item number, I believe it was 14 that we did not yes. complete. Thank Thanks. you. you know. <laughs> so we have to go back to um, agenda item 14. Um, which is the um, agenda for October hearing. So again, I'm going to ask um, the staff to put on uh, the screen uh, the meeting materials related to this agenda item. And it, in full transparency, you know, this is, uh, I didn't put this on the agenda, you know, at, on the agenda for October, for, uh, for September, I wanted there to be a discussion and overview of, of our of task force powers, including our subpoena power. Um, and it was taken out of the agenda and this was placed on the agenda, but I think it kind of undermines what we've already decided. Um, and at our, at our last hearing um, in July, we already decided what the topics would be. Um, you know, in the event that task force members would like to see any of the topics amended, feel free to uh, to speak up. Um, but at this point, I, we can have a discussion about um, what the potential uh, witnesses uh, uh, should be uh, for yeah. these for the two days. Um, I, I am actually going to jump in here. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My recollection is that a couple meetings ago, we 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 moved to adopt these topics as a framework, a skeletal framework of topics for each a subsequent meeting. But we reserve the right to amend. And I have a proposal to add to the topics for the upcoming meeting. Um, and it's included in the materials. I would ask the DOJ to turn to page 97. On page 97, the first item that I think that we should consider talking about in the next series of meetings is the, the subpoena power. Now, I, and I, I talked a little bit to the witnesses about that. Um, and their thoughts about how we should be utilizing our subpoena power strategically to get information that will buttress our ultimate recommendation. So I do think that in the next meeting, we should have a plenary session where we have an opportunity 
to not only talk about the subpoena power and how we may want to strategically use it, but also to get a primer from the DOJ on what that subpoena power entails, because I'm not sure that everyone is completely familiar with how a body like this can exercise its subpoena power. So that is that was one of my recommendations for the next meeting. Um, I would ask to turn also to page 104. Okay, if you could scroll down to where it says, okay, right here, stop, please. Thank you. Um, you, uh, there's a, there is a, another, a, in addition to the subpoena issue, I also think we need to have a substantive discussion in a plenary session on who constitutes the community that will receive reparations. I know Dr. Scott Lewis, had um, introduced this topic a couple of meetings ago. It's it sort of got tabled, and we need to have a robust and fulsome discussion at this point about who constitutes the community of African Americans um, that will receive reparations, and um, what and how do we construe that special consideration for descendants of of slaves? language within that context. There's been there's been a plethora of public comment on that as well. And I do think it's time for this body to have a fulsome discussion of that so that it can inform uh, our questions to witnesses. Um, and so it's something that we grapple with before we start making recommendations. Um, so um, those are those are two plenary items that I, I think it would be important to discuss. And then there are a, a few topics that I do think need to be added um, as far as uh, topical issues to the next two meetings. At this time, what I would ask before I go into the other topics that are not plenary topics, but more subject matter topics, I would ask whether the, the, the task force has any comments about the plenary, the two plenary topics that I am asking to put on the agenda. Um, the only comment I have is I agree with you, uh, Member Holder. I think we should definitely discuss uh, both of these two uh, topics as plenary sessions, uh, definitely in October. And, and for full transparency, I added these two plenary sessions for the September hearing, but they were taken out. So um, I just want to make it clear that, you know, I'm doing my best to make sure all everyone's, you know, suggestions and recommendations are heard. And, you know, I wanted us to have this robust conversation about eligibility um, uh, for this hearing. I also wanted to have a, a discussion um, a, around the other topic that you mentioned again, but they were taken out. So, you know, we need to discuss it sooner rather than later. So I agree with you. Uh, Ma Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you are recognized. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of our task force. I believe I mentioned some time ago, we should consider adding the list of items to be agendized. The restoration of historical sites and institutions that have been destroyed in this state vis-a-vis -vis Allensworth and historical markers for the meeting of 1858 First AME Zion Church where they assembled before they left San Francisco go to British Columbia. There may be other areas. We did have a long discussion about the AME Church down south. I think we should make that a problem matter to be considered. 
but we don't get we don't get rid of the things that are meaning that speak to unity and opportunity in this nation. You know, we've been talking about some of these morals to Confederate folks and evil folk, but we're talking about basic institutions that represented our attempts to establish self-determination. And Allensworth was one. I established by Colonel Allen Allensworth from Kentucky. That's it. Uh, and if I can jump back in here, yeah, uh, Assembly Member Jim Sawyer. Um, I I don't have a problem with with discussion on any of these items. Uh, my concern is, is you, and you can look at the time now. It's four oh four. I don't want to rush through anything that. Dr. Brown wants to talk about, or we even want to talk about, um, about descendants of slaves, or or even our subpoena power. I just want to make sure, one, we're fully briefed on all that's entailed with this. It would be a shame that we talk about something now, and then get some information down the line where we have to make decisions about is that we ultimately we will make decisions maybe six months, a year from now, and we get new information that totally contradicts what information we got right now because we went too fast, or we which would be worse, we didn't give it the 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 merit that it needs on each of those. Um, sometimes it may take an hour or more to go through this. This is not something we should just quickly go through and get some haphazard information. Let's make sure not only that we get all the all the documentation information that's out there, but most important, I think it would be good for all of us here on this on this committee to be fully versed on each of these topics. Um, even now we were looking at from document now that we just got. Um, I think these topics are so important that we shouldn't rush through them. Yeah, we can we can go ahead and do that, um, but I'm just concerned that we we don't give it the the honor each of those deserve to be able to talk through them. And so I I would take that in consideration, and also, you know. We, we, in our efforts, for example, to make sure we had input, we put it at the front end instead of the back end, which was kind of, you know, penny wise, pound food, foolish. Because on the back end, you could go, or we could allow comment to go on and on and not structure it just for an hour. But now we've, we've kind of hemmed folk into into just one hour. So I, I just want us to think through all the permutations that 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 are involved in this so that we value. I want to make sure we value every comment that everybody made and we make sure we give it enough time um, and enough study and consideration. We get enough experts in here um, to to get us up to speed. Uh, Ma Madam Chair, my comments were about future possible putting on agendizing. I'm not talking about right now. I no, no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean you, Dr. Brown. I, I meant we're trying to put some other stuff. I, you're, you're, you're fine. I just want to make sure when your item comes up that we, we give it the full attention and we don't give you 10 minutes or 15 minutes that we actually go into into the subject you want, and we give it its full respect and time. That's okay. what I was talking about. Okay, thank you very well. 
Yeah, and 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 uh, assembly member, that's exactly what we're talking about. We are with this process. We're just trying to figure out what is going to go on our future future agendas, um, and we do want to have an opportunity to discuss each of these matters and bring witnesses on to discuss these matters. But the DOJ needs us to do this preliminary process to decide what is actually going to go on these future agendas so that they can start preparing and collating witnesses. So that's what this is about. Okay, and I just want to make sure they're able to. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to get them off the hook. Let me let me say that clear. I'm not going to get them off the hook from not doing their jobs to to expedite or do whatever we can to, to meet our requirements. But I also want to make sure it, it is doable with all the other stuff we're asking them to do. Some more? On, Maki. Can I make a comment? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, right yeah, I, I have a, a similar logistical question. And um, again, um, I think the points that have been raised are, are good ones. My, my question is more of a technical one in that, for example, in October 12, um, I see that Richard Rothstein might be a witness or a member of the Bruce family um, and so on. And there are other witnesses that are, are being scheduled. So if we um, rejigger the, the agenda to deal with these, um, I'll call them threshold questions that Lisa is raising, does that then uh, postpone the testimony of some of the witnesses? Do we, are we, is there a logistical problem of coordinating, you know, busy people, professors, for example, um, who would testify? Uh, does that throw the schedule off? A staff prepared to ask answers? Member Tamaki's question. Member Tamaki's question. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, this is Sarah Belton. I can respond. Thank you. You're recognized. Thank you. You're recognized. Uh, this is a template agenda of what an October meeting could look like. No witnesses have been uh, confirmed with times at this point. Uh, so, to use an analogy, these are puzzle pieces that we could move. We were simply trying to illustrate that. Even with the ability to move puzzle pieces, you have a very packed um, number of topics and things to cover in two days. Thank you, Madam Chair. Member Tamaki, um, did you have a follow-up question or? No, no, that answered my question that we have some flexibility here to, um, you know, change up the agenda, so. My question is answered. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, so I, think, I think at this point it really is just a procedural issue. How do we proceed to uh, to actually amend the agenda and incorporate some of these items that Dr. Brown and myself have mentioned? Um, I, whether perhaps we could um, move, I don't know if we have to a formal motion to uh, put in these preliminary items that I recommended we talk about, the subpoenas and the community of interest, or whether um, I can work with the DOJ or whether we can have a subcommittee of two work with the DOJ to refine the next agenda. Would anyone like to entertain a motion related to this agenda item? Well, it's Dawn. I, I mean, I would move that uh, Lisa uh, Holder be authorized to work with the DOJ uh, to incorporate uh, the proposed changes, assuming that that's the will of the task force. And so I, I think somebody is going to have to sort of time things out, kind of estimate how long the discussion will be, and then come up with a new 
iteration of the agenda. And I, I think maybe the most efficient way to do this is to authorize a task force member to do that. We did that in connection with the community engagement uh, plan for and Lisa, um, Cheryl Grills was authorized to do that. And that worked well. So I would throw that out as a suggestion. And if it's worthy, then a motion. Well, I will say on June 1, um, Vice Chair Brown and myself were elected as Vice Chairperson and, and Chairperson. And if you, know, you look back at the slides, uh, we were elected to collaborate with the DOJ uh, to finalize agenda materials. So in June 1, the task force authorized Vice Chair Brown and myself um to do to do this work but i agree that if we want to you know change it around amend it or create a subcommittee um that is um, appropriate as well and i would agree with uh, member tamaki's uh, recommendation that member holder work with the doj uh, to make amendments do you want to make that into a form of a motion Member Grills? Sure. Um, I move that member Lisa Holder uh, be, be authorized to work with the DOJ staff to make uh, amendments to what will be the final agenda for our October meeting. It's been moved by member Grills that Lisa Holder uh, work with the DOJ uh, to implement amendments to the agenda for the October hearing. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded that Lisa Holder uh, will be authorized by the task force uh, to work with the DOJ uh, to finalize the amendments uh, for the uh, October hearing. Is there any discussion on this matter? Madam Chair, I do have a question for clarification. Um, this motion would authorize a member holder on top of the duties already set out by the chair and vice chair, correct? That's what I would like clarity on as well. Where does that leave, if we do authorize this to occur, where does that leave Vice Chair Brown and myself um, and the duties that we've already authorized, been authorized to do by the task force? My understanding of the duties that were authorized by the task force when you were elected was to act, but it wasn't exclusive. So if the if the body chooses to either expand that to have someone, and I think from what I understand from hearing this is because those recommendations were of member holder. And so she can best, you know, uh, demonstrate to the DOJ where it sits. I mean, it's preliminary. So is that going to mean that it's going to be, you know, at what point and, and all of that? So with regard to the intricacies, she would be best based on what I'm hearing uh, to work with them. That doesn't mean that Chairman um, um, Moore or Vice Chair Brown are excluded from, you know, providing information or, or talking with DOJ because they are, you know, they are the, the heads of the of the task force and can consistently, you know, speak with them, communicate with them as you are authorized to do. But the okay. task force is taking an additional step so that they can, you know, do what needs to happen. Otherwise, the entire, uh, based on this recommendation, based on this article, the entire task force would have to sit and decide, you know, how you're going to do that because that's what the agenda item is. Yeah, so no, done, that, actually, I disagree. Uh, member Monica is. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, um, I just wanted to make sure we've already given authorization. I, I agree with um, the member holders' um, uh, suggestions, actually. I very much agree with them. I just want to make sure that we're being, um, you know, not retracting what we've done in the past. That's all. It's a prime, my understanding is the chair and vice chair's primary role is to, uh, you know, um, authorize kind of what's on that agenda for for a body like ours to, to be able to discuss. And so I just want to make sure that we are in order and that this is, uh, 
a supplement and, and I'm in complete agreement with that. Thank you. And to be quite clear and, and for transparency, right? Uh, Vice Chair Brown and myself, uh, we were working on the, the agenda for September. Uh, the agenda, and in working on the agenda, we were looking through uh, suggestions uh, uh, for the agenda from all task force members. Two of those suggestions were from Lisa Holder, and that included a discussion on uh, the task force subpoena power and um, 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 on, on the other topic. I included, we included those agenda items on the September hearing. They were taken out by DOJ staff. We would, we would have had a discussion about the subpoena power during these two days. Um, we would have had a discussion about um, the other topic related to eligibility and, and who's included, right, during these two days. You know, because as vice chair and as chair, we were doing our duties for over a month to make sure that all task force suggestions were included, but they were taken out by the DOJ and now we are here, right? That is an issue for me. I'm being very clear and transparent about that. Vice Chair Brown and myself, we were elected to collaborate with the DOJ to do this work. We haven't been wholly respected by the DOJ with our duties and now we're here. So to be quite honest, I'm even asking if we could even have a closed session between now and the notice period for the next October hearing, so that as a task force, we can talk candidly um, about how do we all get on the same page to make sure that this task force runs um, in the way that it should. So that's something that I'm also putting on the table in light of the many public comments that we've received between these past two days, there has to be some type of conversation about how, about how do we all get on board with each other. I also would like to recognize Vice Chair Brown at this moment if you have any comments uh, about- Madam, Madam, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, members of the, of the um, task force, I think you was adequately my sentiment. Uh, this matter should be a partnership and there'd be no hierarchical treatment. We are a task force that was created to do a job. And we should not, I feel, be excluded, uh, disenfranchised in exercising our legal authority so that if there is some reason that the staff feels certain things shouldn't be done, just say it, talk to us. But I think it's a bit much for arbitrary decisions to be made without any discussion. So I hope that the other task force members feel the same and that they would be candid and express their position on it, this matter. A point of clarification, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to make sure that um, folks understand my intention was not to disenfranchise or exclude the chair and vice chair. It was in res with respect to the fact that member Holder made specific res recommendations and has a particular understanding about what is intended in those, recommend those recommendations and who would be best served to address those topics. Um, but that was the reason that I agreed with this idea of her being given the authority to work with the DOJ on this. I also procedurally didn't assume that if she's tasked with that, that no task force member couldn't still weigh in and send information to either 
attorney holder or to the staff uh, with recommendations or thoughts about the topics for the October meeting, inclusive of the chair and the vice chair. And then of course, procedurally, I also assume that before any agenda goes out, I'm vice chair of a, a county commission. And when I was vice chair or chair, which I've been several times, an agenda never went out, regardless of who was giving input on it, without the chair seeing that agenda. Well, I'm glad, Member Grills, that you brought that up because that was not the case for this September hearing. In fact, DOJ staff sent Vice Chair Brown and myself um, a, a, an agenda uh, on Friday, this last Friday, which was different than the agenda that was sent out to members of the public and other task force members on Monday. So that is that that is not the case. That is not what is happening <laughs> during this process. So this is part and parcel why I think there needs to be a closed session mm -hmm. so that everyone is on the same page about our duties and responsibilities and our roles. Ma uh, Madam Chair, uh, you cannot hold a closed session under um, the Bagley Keene Act. So that's that that you can't do. There's no authorization for a closed session. It specifically identifies under what circumstances a closed session can be held, and this is not one. Uh, this has to be an open meeting, and you can set it for an agenda item and, and go from that point, but you cannot hold a closed session. Um, I, I, would, I don't have before me um, readily available the minutes to which you refer. I think uh, maybe one of the staff can better respond that, to that, but I, when uh, Dr. Grills indicated that, um, seconded the motion, it was, it's a procedural, you know, it, it, it was really to expedite what now, <laughs> you know, I mean, you could have just continued with this during this meeting, but that was basically to help expedite the program. But if you have questions regarding procedure, then I think you need to address that to DOJ and, and ask that that be on an agenda so that you can have it vetted openly at, the, you know, at the meeting. Well, my, my, my well, under the Bagley Keene Act, under the Bagley Keene Act, there are options for an, a, a closed section, yeah, particularly like that is section correct, 1126A I'm, and yes. 1126C3, the personnel exception and the deliberations exception. This is not at first that. You said, this, okay. No, I said that there are specific provisions for closed session for state, mm -hmm. uh, at, you know, for state bodies. This is a state body. So you have to follow specifically what is authorized under uh, the Bagley Keene Act that allows for a closed session. And what I am saying, this is not a personnel matter. So it doesn't meet that qualification. Um, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Vice Chair Brown. We got at this point of needing to this discussion because there were some things that were done by the staff and we have nothing to hide. We can say it before the world from the mountaintop. And the basic issue is if we as a task force have established a basic structure that is within the law of chair, Vice Chair and members of this task force, we should respect the protocol that has been established, in my estimation, and it should never be that any staff would make changes and decisions without respecting the leadership and saying why they made the change. And if they're justifiable reasons, we're civil and decent enough to hear it, but we ought to iron things out together and not be operating in silos. So that's the thing that this task force has the moral obligation to make very clear to the governor, to the assembly, and all those legislative partners, as Rita Franklin says, 
R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And we need to respect each other and definitely respect protocol. That's what the issue is about. And when it comes to placing things on the agenda, if we talk with each other as chair and vice chair, why do we need to reinvent the wheel on matters? Hello. Hello. Ms. Moore, you're on mute. Good morning, you're mute. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to quickly clarify. Um, you know, the ideas around the topics around the subpoena power um, and the topic around eligibility, that didn't only come from member holder. Um, those are also ideas that I had um, in mind as well. Again, we both wanted to discuss these topics for this this two-day hearing, and they were taken out by the DOJ. So I just wanted to make that clear that it didn't only come from member holder. And so still at this time, I'm, I'm struggling with, in, in full transparency, how are we going to develop the agenda, including Confirming, confirming witnesses for this October hearing and and December, but we can focus on October. Um, Chair Moore, can I be heard? Yes. Um, just a, a couple things. One is it is possible that we could, I know there's a motion on the floor, so I'm not putting one on the floor, um, but there's possible that we could um, potentially move to to add those things to the October agenda and uh, give um, if there are things that need to be taken off um, if we have to make that decision today I'd rather not but if we have to then I'm okay with that as well um, I'm just putting that out there the other thing is that I think as a task force um, on the subject that we are studying I think it's very important that we um, based also based on the restrictions of us not being able to talk to each other. <laughs> very important for me to show support for our chair and vice chair to staff um, and make that very clear um, that I don't know what has happened, but I know that in the order of things and the way that we have voted as uh, a body that, you know, if if there are things that are that are coming before us as a body that haven't gone through our chair and vice chair that we've given that authority to, then that's a problem for all of us. And what I don't want to do is get stuck in the procedure. Um, this is what the system does. This, you know, we get stuck in the procedure. We don't get to the substance, and then we fall in the same trap. We're supposed to be kind of rising above that, even the proposals that we move forward and everything that we do. So I just don't, I, I'm, I don't want to get stuck in that. I also don't want anything to be personal, right? Because we can't, you know, really talk to each other. We're not around each other. So this is nothing against anyone that has supported a motion, put a motion on the floor. It's not about that for me. It's just wow. though I see larger picture procedure getting in the way of the substance. I think most of us probably agree that at the very least we want to see the subpoena power and we want to discuss eligibility on the next agenda. So, um, Madam Chair. Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Yes, uh, and the parliamentarian, I, I, we, need, we need some help here. We need to clear up something. <laughs> Is it a fact that we are gagged and we can't talk to each other? I that thought is correct. That, that is correct. You, you cannot, no more than two of you can talk together well, on a topic so, what's so outside of the meeting. Ms. Johnson? Yes. So it needs to be made clear because people are getting confused. We can talk to each other. But you outside can't of the, have, uh, yes, outside, I'm uh, sorry, Dr. Have, Brown. We cannot have a, 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 a group 
that would represent a committee in violating the transparency law. That's all. I can talk to any individual I want to talk to, but I can't have no official meeting to do anything. I would defer to DOJ with regard to Bagley Keene. Um, keep in mind that what you've been told is that when three or more of you speak or meet, and it could be at a social gathering, you still cannot discuss the business that's before this body at that meeting. We're you not must... talking about three or more, Madam, Ms. Johnson. No, no not... that's what I'm saying. Yes. Two people okay. can meet. All right, so, so, but, but the previous speakers have been saying we can't talk to each other and we need to get rid of that boogeyman. It's, it's a contextual what... thing. I, I think I was clear. I hope I was clear in terms of what you, you can do, but perhaps you might want to add that to a prime, uh, primer from DOJ and ask them to clarify for you what it is under Bagley King you can and cannot do so that you are clear on that because that's very important that you understand. And I agree with you, Dr. Brown, if there's an if there's an inconsistent interpretation, that's not helping you. But what you do want to do is know what the rule is so that you can, you know, apply it in all your dealing. But in this instance, um, you know, it, it, this is this is a matter for your, you know, for your um, your task force. Uh, it, and as I heard, someone made a motion to do X, that is the matter before you um, that, you know, so you can carry that out and like any other motion, vote it up or down and then uh, move from there. And if you want to, to withdraw the motion, that's another option. And if you want to withdraw it and, and authorize adding those two items on the agenda as it is to amend it in that way, then you can do that. So those are two, you know, two options that you have available with respect to where you stand right now. Does that? I hope that helps. <laughs> no, that 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 helps a lot. Um, I I would suggest that uh, someone go ahead and and perhaps make the motion to withdraw the previous motion and to just go ahead and put the two items on the next agenda. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Parliamentarian Johnson, you are recognized. Yes, I, then, then she is moving to uh, just add those two items, the preliminary items that you mentioned earlier to the agenda. Okay, there is a motion. So as member holder is putting in the motion. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is a motion from uh, member Holder to withdraw the previous motion. Um, is there a second? Because I want to take it in two no, parts. No, she just wants to, the second wants to withdraw her second. I mean, that's what's before you now. So have the seconder, whoever seconded the motion, withdraw yes. the second. Yes. Is there a second? You have to withdraw the second. Just they want to withdraw the second, not make a second. She wants to withdraw her motion that she made or whoever made the motion to me. Right. Okay. So, so the person. Okay. Yeah. I was making. Okay. So it's member girls. Go ahead. So I withdraw my motion. Okay. Yes. I was going to say the person who made the motion um, has to withdraw it. Uh, so thank you member uh, member grills. So at this time, uh, will anyone like to entertain a motion related to this agenda item? What? If this is formalized as possible, so there needs to be another motion to include the two agenda, uh, the two topics into the agenda. All right, I, I will make a motion to include on the next meeting agenda two items. The first item being uh, a primer and discussion on the task force's subpoena power. Second item being a discussion on the community of eligibility for reparation. Thank you. There is a motion and it has been moved by member Holder to add these two items to the agenda for October. One, a discussion 
on the overview of subpoena power for the task force, and two, a discussion on the community of eligibility. Is there a second? I will second. It has, pro it has been properly moved and seconded that we add these following agenda items to the October hearing. One, a topic on subpoena power, and two, a topic surrounding a, a community of eligibility. Is there any discussion on this matter? Yeah, I have a question, this is Steve Bradford. I, I really need clarity on the fact that the DOJ has veto power on our agenda. I mean, I'm, I'm really troubled by that, and that's where we really need to be clear on going forward. Yeah. Either we're the body who's empowered to move this task force forward and set our own agenda to address what uh, 8312 said we, uh, we should do, or it's the DOJ, and I don't think that's what the bill stated. So I just want to know going forward, we shouldn't have to go through these you know, maneuvers to put something back on on agenda that we originally agendized for a meeting. And can we get clarity from that, from uh, it be it Ms. Johnson or Ms. Belton, that who we have the authority to set our own agenda? Who's I guess not. I guess you call for the Ms. vote, but if they want to answer that afterwards, I, I really like answers to that. Okay, we'll, we'll return uh, return to that. Thank you, uh, Member Bradford. Uh, so it has been properly moved and seconded that we'll add, as I said, the two agenda items to the discussion. Is there uh, to the agenda? Um, is there any further discussion on this matter? Excuse me. Call for the question, Jim. Don't do that. Okay. So we will. I will now turn to Parliamentary Johnson, who will then turn to uh, Ms. Belton, so that we can take the roll call vote. Yes, um, Madam Chair, um, Attorney Belton, would you please call for the vote on the call of the question? Thank you, Chair Moore and Parliamentarian Johnson. We will vote by member, and please indicate your vote by aye, nay, or abstain. Chair Moore, your vote, please. Chair Moore votes aye. Vice Chair Dr. Brown? Yes. Yes. Vice Chair Dr. Brown votes yes. Senator Stephen Bradford? Aye. Aye. Senator Stephen Bradford votes aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills? Aye. Aye. Dr. Cheryl Grills votes aye. Assembly Member, Re excuse me, Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer? Aye. Aye. Assembly, Reg Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer votes aye. Lisa Holder? Aye. Aye. Lisa Holder votes aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis? Aye. Aye. Dr. Javon Scott Lewis votes aye. Don Tamaki? Aye. aye. Don Tamaki votes aye. Council Member Monica Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Aye. Council Member Monica Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Madam Chair, on the motion, there are nine members present in voting. There are nine I votes, zero nay votes, and zero abstentions. Thank you, Ms. Belton. There were nine I votes and zero nay votes. The ayes have it, and so the motion carries. Um, now, if we can return uh, to Member Bradford, Ms. Belton, are you prepared to answer his question at this time? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Bradford, I would simply say that the Department of Justice is carrying out the directives of the task force as authorized by the task force as a body of nine members, um, and that our staff has worked pretty diligently um, to be able to deliver on the many directives of the task force members, um, as I think you've seen here on the two-day meeting uh, yesterday and today. Thank you. Um, but you didn't ask the question on whether you have the power on our items or not. I no one's questioned thoroughly of the work that you've done in carrying out the task, but we had two items specifically on this agenda for this meeting that were removed. So we want to know who has the authority to set 
the, the either it's a task force or it's DOJ. Uh, I believe, thank you, Senator Bradford. I believe in our initial presentation in June, we specifically said we would collaborate with the chair and the vice chair to set the agenda. We have certainly done that uh, and we will continue to do so. Respectfully, this is why, you know, I'm asking clarity on, on a, a closed session um, under the personnel exception, because under the personnel exception, we can have a closed session to evaluate the performance of staff or, uh, or a particular staff member. Um, yes, Vice Chair Brown, you're recognized. Yeah. Um, the question was not answered. Why was it changed, was there a miscommunication, misstep on their part, or what? And that and we need to bless and assure us that this will not happen again, and that we're gonna to work together. But it didn't happen in this previous situation. And that's the reason why the question was raised by my brother. So, um, we, it's unfortunate we have to make the assumption that the message has been gotten over. So I think we should move on, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair Brown. Okay. Ask a question, Chair Moore. Do you recognize? Yeah, without, uh, again, further prolonging this d discussion, I'm just wondering if uh, it's an issue of authority in terms of the Attorney General's office being able to respond and answer these questions. I mean, some of them may may well be, for example, the Saturday meetings may be beyond um, the authority that um, Ms. Belton can, can provide. Maybe we need to be talking to someone higher up in the Attorney General's office to answer these questions. I, I think they're totally legitimate and they're the right questions to ask. Um, but I wanna make sure we're talking to the right people too. And Brother, uh, Don, Brother Don. Yes. Madam Chair, excuse me. Brother Don, I can answer that question. Yes, please. Att attempts have been made to speak to the Attorney General and the high ups. With evasive posture. I say no more. To be specific, we've had a meeting with Michael Newman, who is a higher up and, you know, evasive um, and agreed with, you know, staff and taking out agenda items that, you know, task force members wanted included. Um, and so we are, you know, working on meeting with more higher ups, right? So we're working on meeting with the chief of staff of Bonta's office and Bonta himself and Secretary Weber to address these issues. Well, I'm, I, this is Steve Bradford. I'm gonna place a personal call into Attorney General Bonta and, and get clarity on this issue because uh, it makes no sense, really. I, no disrespect to staff, but I've, I've served on plenty of boards and I've never known where staff has be the power over it, either elected or appointed board and setting that agenda. Thank you. We would appreciate your help on this matter. So, you know, we're over time and we still, we haven't gotten to a discussion on potential witnesses. And I, I, before we close, you know, I want to do my due diligence. And I wanted to ask of the names that are listed on the tentative agenda for witnesses, I wanted to seek clarity if that's proper. Um, if any of if any of these names or which names came from task force members um, and which names came from staff, it's, it's something that I would want clarity on, um, but we have run out of time. Uh, um, Member Tamaki, you are recognized. So, for this is, you know, I think maybe others People have suggested these names, They're certainly in the written materials that have been provided. But with respect to housing, uh, Richard Rostein and Helen Kang, 
um, Rothstein has done this ground ground study on the impact of redlining and segregation and redevelopment. And Helen Kang did, did a uh, law review study focusing on the Bayview Hunters Point and the Fillmore. So I thought those were particularly illustrative of the issues that you know happen throughout California. And they are leading authorities, so I did suggest those too. Great, thank you so much, uh, Member Tamaki, for that information. Uh, would any other a task force member like to speak on any a witness suggestion for our next hearing before we conclude? Well, this is Bradford again. As the author of SB 796, that will return the property to the Bruce's family. Uh, who have you identified? Because I didn't see a name associated with this. And the name I would like to see is Anthony Bruce, because he's the only direct descendant. He's the great great grandson of Willa and Charles Bruce. And his voice has pretty much been, I won't say silent, but not engaged as much in what has happened in California. He's gotten a lot of media attention as of late, but I would just really love to hear from him and what this means to him directly. Uh, uh, and I know we've had Chief uh, Yellow Feather, uh, Dwayne Shepard and Kavon Ward, who's been a, a, a tremendous champion on this, but I would just like to hear from the direct descendant of the Bruce family, the great grandson, Anthony Bruce. So. That's my thoughts as it relates to Bruce Beach. And hopefully we'll have a signature from the governor in the next week. Thank you, Member Bradford, for that witness recommendation. Uh, Member Scott Lewis, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Um, I haven't been consulted on any of the potential, potential witnesses, but when it comes to the, the topic of environmental racism, um, I would at least like to be consulted uh, by the DOJ on possible witnesses, uh, given my position as chair of the Department of Geography, which has a specialism in that area. Um, the proposed names, while leaders in some of the thinking around environmental racism, I could think of alternatives who have a more direct experience with the history of the state of California and African-American communities in the state. Um, so I would like to be consulted and perhaps we could have a conversation um, around that via email um, through the normal consultative uh, process. Great, thank you so much for that member, Scott Lewis. Um, any other members of the task force um, before we conclude would like to make their witness uh, recommendations and suggestions known at this time for October hearing? I just have a Your few names. Agenda. Oh, I have a few names. Um, I would like to endorse some of the names that are already on the agenda, uh, namely uh, Marissa Bedrin, uh, who is a law professor at UC Irvine. Um, also Dorothy Brown, who is a tax uh, law professor. Um, I'm suggesting Ta-Nehisi Coates, who wrote um, um, the, time, uh, uh, the Case for Reparations, uh, which is related to housing discrimination. Um, I'm also suggesting uh, James Anderson, uh, who wrote a book about education for Blacks in the South. Um, and we have some interesting information to impart. Also, potentially, uh, Bobby Seale, who is a, a founder and chairman um, of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and Elaine Brown. And someone from uh, the Black Farmers uh, Movement and, and, and Union because there's a lot of uh, developments on that uh, going on right now. Okay. Um, I would like to, um, if, if there's not any other questions or comments uh, from members of the task force at this time, um, I would like to conclude the meeting and thank you all for your dedication and commitment. That includes uh, staff and members of the public. Um, at this time, I would like to adjourn the meeting. The meeting is adjourned, thank you.